Hello, I'm John Bradbury from the People Experience team here at the EMA. Um, in this series of EMA Cast, we're looking at sort of new trends, new thinking around HR and the employee experience in, in particular. And um, one of the subjects that comes up a lot when you're talking about the employee experience is about, you know, how, do, how does an organisation best find out what the views of its employees are and how does an organisation best a act on that? And so I'm very pleased that in this conversation, I'm going to be talking to Luke Adamson, who comes from the uh, Workday PECON, uh, Employee Voice, and um, he has worked there for a number of years, and, uh, and in my view, one of the experts around this area of, of listening in organisations and how organisations can best use that. Um, but I think maybe if, if Luke kind of introduces himself and tell us a bit about your background, Luke. Yeah, thanks, John. Really nice to be here uh, with you today. Uh, I've been in the, the employee experience and employee feedback world for coming up to six and a half years now. Um, and that was uh, six and a half years ago, employee experience wasn't very much of a topic, right? Uh, where you fast forward to today and it's front of mind for most CEOs, boards and executive management teams. Um, and so it's really been a privilege to, to be on that journey uh, because when I joined what was PECON at the time, uh, it was a tiny little startup in London that no one had never, ever heard of. Uh, and it, we grew from uh, a single room there with about 16 employees to uh, over almost 300 about um, five years later uh, with an acquisition by one of the biggest uh, HR tech companies in the world. Um, and uh, the last three years of that was building a business here in ANZ, which has just been... Uh, an absolute privilege uh, and such a fun uh, experience that I'll, you know, I'll be telling my my grandkids hopefully one day about. Um, and you know, before that, I was in I was in consulting um, here in New Zealand uh, before, and also when I moved to London, uh, I did about before peak on about six years in in the SaaS cloud space as well. So kind of. Um, Done the the technology into HR into employee experience uh, and now deep into the into the data. Um, about two years ago, Workday acquired uh, Pecon, and so the Pecon's now within the Workday product suite. Very interesting. So quite 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 so many things there that I think are going to be worth exploring today. I mean, I think that background where you bring the sort of the tech experience and the HR experience and the employee experience experience uh, together, bringing those together. The, the fact that you've been in the, in the business and the area for some years, so you'd have seen changes during that time. And also, I guess, you know, your journey from a startup uh, to becoming part of a much larger sort of company as well. So quite a few sort of things there that I think will be of interest interest to people. Um, I guess, um, you know, if I kind of wind it kind of right back and, Sorry. you know, um, for me, this, this, this space really started off being about like the annual engagement survey. And yeah, so and we've moved, moved on from there. I, I'm just kind of interested in, you know, how you'd characterise the difference between sort of employee listening, uh, we do now, yes. with the sort of the annual engagement survey and what, what's, so, what's different about it? Great question. I think the sentiment is we've moved on from there, but mm -hmm. um, a lot of businesses would still probably be in that category today. Mm -hmm. Maybe the larger businesses um, uh, who've been around longer and doing their annual engagement survey for many, many years. And I have to take my hat off to the annual engagement survey. Without that uh, and, and what that became, PECOM probably wouldn't have evolved. Um, because the, the sentiment behind getting employee feedback, actioning that to make it a better place to work, well, that's, that's what the goal really was since the beginning. Um, but, but what that became was an absolute headache for virtually everyone involved, um, including the employee who didn't enjoy it, didn't see the change, and didn't, you know, wh why am I doing this was the most, off, the most common refrain, right? Uh, employee listening, I think, takes a much different approach where the engagement survey was about how many, how, like how big a participation rate can we get and what's our score? Uh, and is that changed from last year, better or worse? 
Whereas employee listening is about what's going on right now in our, our employee's world. Uh, how has that changed in a much more nuanced way from last week or last month? Uh, and what can we do about that collectively as a, as a business to create the employee experience that we want for our employees, right? Uh, and how does that data inform that employee experience strategy uh, that we have? And that's a much different proposition uh, because employee listening, you don't listen to someone once a year. You know, if they're your best friend, you are listening to them constantly, right? And the, one, the, the people you spend more time than your best friend or your spouse or your family are your workmates, right? And so listening to people who work for you and also work around you uh, is, is such an important thing to be able to do today. Um, a lot of businesses have got there, but I would also say a lot of businesses, um, they think they're there where they've moved away from an annual engagement survey, but if you ask the senior management team or the HR manager, do I have the data to action uh, at any point throughout the year on how to improve the employee experience? I wouldn't necessarily say we're there yet for a lot of businesses. Right, so it still seems like a, like a journey, but there's definitely things that you're talking about there, like a difference um, where we are now with listening is really, really around frequency. Uh, of input, it sounds like, and frequency of conversation with your employees and about uh, making sure that it's actionable, so things things that can, can happen. Yeah, when you remove what was the incredibly arduous process of a manual survey, you know, even paper-based survey, and, and bring modern tech into it, um, the automation that can occur it, when done correctly means you know a lot of businesses and some of the biggest in the world hundreds of thousands of employees um, will give their feedback weekly right. in some businesses to, uh, today um, and a lot of businesses I think fall into a cadence that's either more monthly or quarterly uh, really it doesn't the frequency isn't isn't the the goal right like it's not a goal that everyone needs to be listening to their employees weekly because that's not feasible for a lot of businesses where you have non say non desk based employees where it's harder to get the feedback in the first place um, but it needs to match the the cadence of your business right and the the frequency of the change that you see uh, both in the business and your employees and matching that means you're able to act in the moment and that moment doesn't need to be he just here and today. It could be across the quarter uh, or the three months. Um, and really, uh, what you are looking for, it, it, it's no longer about the score either. Yeah. You know, I tell, I tell a lot of business boards when, I, when we sit down and review what's going on in their business, I say, you know, that's a starting point. That, that, that can be helpful uh, as an overall gauge of has, what's gone up or down. But ignore it, because really what you're looking for are the actionable comments or the more nuanced changes of what's driving that overall number. Um, and that you have to go much deeper into the data to actually uncover. Uh, and you know, the, the actionability of that is far higher, because it's much more specific to certain areas of your employee experience than just our engagement score. Right. So I'm hearing like tie it much more to what your business is doing. So it's a major initiative or a major change. Um, if something particularly that's disrupted the business, then focus on that, but not getting hooked into, right, it's the end of the quarter, we run, we run our survey. It's very much around thinking about the business and being more agile around that. 100%. Yeah. Be agile in, in what you're listening for. Yeah. But you also need a methodology. And this is actually where a lot of businesses go wrong in their employee listening strategy. It becomes uh, what I kind of call an ad hoc survey at the management's discretion. <laughs> um, and employees hate that. Yeah. You have to have, if you want to create longevity in your listening program that informs your employee experience overall, you have to bring consistency and methodology into it. Um, the agile piece is around reacting to that feedback yeah. and then bringing it what's in the moment, uh, right? And, you know, COVID was a classic example. Um, most metrics of engagement uh, and employee experience stopped mattering to your average employee the day 
that their world changed intrinsically. Uh, and so flipping, being able to flip what you're listening for in that moment uh, is really important. Most businesses weren't able to do it because they didn't have uh, a tool uh, in place or a, an ability to easily listen to their employees. Um, but the, the methodology is important because you have to understand uh, in, a, uh, in a more nuanced way what is driving the experience, right? And you can't just measure an overall one question capture of uh, employees, you know, um, interest in recommending you as a place to work is a very common one, right? Mm -hmm. It's called the ENPS question. And it's an important metric, but that is probably more informed by their manager or their um, experience in the most recent performance cycle or their ability to do the things that they feel they're best at doing every day. Um, and unless you ask questions consistently within that methodology, you're not going to get the be able to drive the change in the overall sentiment uh, in the way that you want. Does that make does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So I was starting to think there. It's it sounds like you're starting to say, well, we have to we 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 get a score, we get a number, we've asked a question, and then we want to drill into it to understand what's led to that that result, and then think about well, what could we do to move it to wherever we want to move it for, for the business output? Would, would that be a fair summary? Exactly. And, yes. and really what you want to encourage, especially if you're thinking about uh, putting in a listening program. Yes. Right? Your, your business is growing. If it, it might feel like, hey, um, we're not in the same room anymore. <laughs> we're distributed around the country. Mm. I, I usually kind of say if you have, you know, more than 25 employees, or you're geographically distributed across uh, more than one office. You know, that's kind of your indication of, hey, let's put something in place uh, that we're, so we're able to monitor uh, those changes. Um, and really from there, what you want is, uh, is comments. Mm -hmm. You need, a number is a number, that's yeah. fine. But what is driving that number? And um, to get that from your employees, you have to create trust. And that is such a, a hot topic at the moment, um, but it is something that's actually, it's not automatic. Mm -hmm. you know, the psychological safety in me offering even confidential feedback in a business that might be critical of a strategy or a process or even potentially a person, right? I have to feel safe in offering it um, and management have to go out of their way, especially early on in any listening program, to instill that safety. Uh, in particular, if uh, you have employees who's, you know, who wouldn't normally speak up because there's a, there could be a lot riding on this job for their family and, and you know, their, their, broader, um, their broader life. And really, you know, they're not gonna be critical unless it's an incredibly safe place to do that. Um, so that's a really important nuance in getting the right information from your listening program. Again, it's not about a number. It's about what's yeah. driving the underneath that, what's the comments that, that really contribute to that. Okay, so this this is this is fascinating because it sounds like, you know, there, there's a decision to purchase a listening program, a piece of software sure. or a, a survey. And what, what you're really drawing attention to there is actually um, – you know, if you were completely agnostic around that, it would always be, well, for this to work, you have to build trust in the organisation. I kept hearing you, you don't want the situation where either people don't complete the questionnaire because they don't trust or don't feel they're going to listen to or just click through it. Everything is a 10 or a 5, but, you know, just that. So what sort of things can organisations do that help create the right environment for the listening programme to give the value that they want? <laughs> uh, million dollar question, John. Um, uh, I think, first of all, uh, management, you know, this is a top down piece, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Management have to show that they are open to the feedback. Yeah. Um, and a really important part of that is being transparent. Right. So let's say you, you start off on your listening journey, you get some data back. How quickly have you shared that with your business? Um, I had a, there was a quite a large business in New Zealand um, uh, started, started listening to their employees frequently. And I remember 
this was a couple of years ago, I remember sitting in their auditorium um, a day after their, I think it was their second survey round closed, uh, and they had called their top 150 leaders from around the business um, into the auditorium, had uh, their senior management team up on stage, and behind them was all the data, like the, the aggregated data of here's what we just heard. And this is like the day after in a relatively large business, right? And that really changed the tone in the entire business moving forward of how important this feedback was, right? So that transparency, whether you're a 50-person business or a few thousand people, is really, really important. And then demonstrating, hey, we heard you, and we're going to do something about it. And this is 101 stuff, right? Like, kind of seems obvious, but most of the time... <laughs> That doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, and that's really unfortunate because if I'm, as an employee, offering a heartfelt, meaningful feedback on something that is affecting my working life and my experience at this company, and I perceive that it goes into a black hole, well, that's not very fun. Yeah. Right? And I'm not going to offer that in the future because it just doesn't matter. So really communicate, over-communicating back to your employees, hey, we hear you, and here's what we intend or have done about that feedback. And yeah. broadcast that wide. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be just a single team that the feedback is influencing. It's everybody. I mean, that's, that's nice. That, I think that illustrates a kind of loop to it, the kind of virtuous circle that you're trying to create that, that creates change in the organization. Um, but I, I'm, I'm intrigued. I mean, I've, I've often is, is looked at these sort of surveys and thought very much, you know, very, very applicable and get used a lot in larger organizations. But and, you know, the example you just gave was sort of 150 managers up, up on the stage. Now, you, you also mentioned earlier that, you know, maybe this starts to become applicable when you start to get sort of 20, 25 people, maybe you're geographically uh, distributed. Um, you know, is, are there any significant differences when you're a smaller organization, the sort of 20 to 220 sort of size around running these sort of surveys? What sort of things should people be thinking about if they're thinking about running a listening survey as opposed to what they probably do when, you know, everyone, you know, 16 people sitting in a room as you were in London and everyone could just talk to each other every day? You know, what do, what do those organizations from 20 to 220 need to think about about whether to put a survey like this sort of in place? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I think, and this is hard for a lot, you know, especially the smaller end where yeah. it's often owner operated yeah. business to uh, admit to yourself as that owner or the senior executive that your intuition um, isn't necessarily going to going to solve the challenge here or, or you don't have the your intuition doesn't bring the full picture to to the plate uh, in making data driven decisions if um, and if you can come to that realization or uh, you know and, and that might be easy and be like yep I'm already there great but that is one of the biggest hurdles to a listening uh, program going into place uh, within organizations and the senior management think they they know. Yeah. Um, so there's one piece is is just realizing that there the data that can back up your intuition is just as important, right? Like that's that's the the other side to that coin. And if you don't have it, um, you could be going down the wrong direction very very quickly. I think the other piece is consider the goal. Like, what do what is where are we taking the business this year and next year, um, you know, from a scaling perspective and, and the growth in, in headcount or new products, new market, et cetera? And how do we tie uh, what we want to listen for to the outcomes in our business? Because right? at the end of the day, you want your best people to stay with you. And this is one of the, the strongest mechanisms you can use to help ensure you don't have that regrettable attrition. Uh, is the data as you are growing to ensure you're on the right track. Because as we've seen with the last three years, change is felt by everyone in your business far more frequent uh, in, in kind of the new working world and far more nuanced than, than we're used to, right? And we need to recognize that our employee at home, maybe, um, 
is experiencing things right now that we don't have the full picture on anymore mm -hmm. uh, and, and understanding the data element to that um, and it through their feedback can it help us grow, help us achieve our business outcomes. And in tying that, it really gives you um, the kind of the, the clarity in the pursuit. Right? It's not just about um, your, your KPIs. You know, it's intrinsically also about wanting the best for your people, but they're not exclusive uh, and, and they should be aligned very clearly. Right. OK. So, I mean, it sounds like it's very much an approach that, you know, considers particular organization circumstances, pursuing particular organization goals. But, you know, I see a lot f that comes out from the various survey companies that, that there are that says these are the trends. These this is the, this is what's sort of happening in terms of, you know, in, in terms of New Zealand. So, you know, things like, oh, you know, well-being has become even more important or divergent views on um, remote working that you just alluded to um, you know you you look at a lot of data and yes. you've seen a lot of data you know is there anything in that area that you see at the moment that you um, could share with us yeah I mean you mentioned two of them that are hot topics now and they were last year and mm. I would think they're only going to to continue to grow let's take let's take the remote work for example some businesses, it's just not possible, yeah. right? You have to be in a room, to, uh, uh, in a place to do your job. So n not really much of a conversation. Most businesses, it's very possible. And what we are seeing in the movement in the last three years to remote work, and now the movement back into offices, almost mandated at times by management, um, is there is a real crisis of trust. And you can see that in the data around trusting that your coworkers are doing the best work they can, those scores are not the same. Right. Um, and uh, that trust is very difficult to, to build on Slack <laughs> yes. or on email or a video call. There's no social, personal interaction um, when you're sitting alone in your home, right? And um, you have to find new ways to build it. If you go for a remote first strategy, good on you. Great. You know, like you are opening up a talent market that was never available to you and that could be awesome for your business. It's not necessarily the way to go for everyone, but, but how do you then build trust between, you know, 50 people who are all in 50 different locations? Not easy. And not, never, not many businesses before the last couple of years even had to think about that challenge. Because yeah. it was always, no, you're in this city, in this office, nine to five. Um, wellness is, is interesting because, uh, yes, everyone is suffering, uh, to, like, if, that's, if that's the right word. You know, like there's a mental health crisis mm. going on. I, think, I don't think that's news to, to many right now. Um, but when you look at engagement data, it's your frontline managers that are um, suffering the most, actually. In most businesses, in the last three years, you see more attrition and uh, much, you know, much more red flags of burnout in managers than you do uh, necessarily in frontline employees. But as, as often senior leadership assume, well, managers are there to look after their teams, and so they're good, and we need to focus on, on the team, and that is a mistake. Um, yes, focus on, <laughs> on the broader group of people, but if that one person um, is really struggling and you don't recognize it, the knock-on effect is really big. So I think that's one piece, is, is focus on your leaders and offer them something unique um, to really help them through any challenges they might be facing from a, a, a wellness perspective. Um, and that's, you know, that's physical, mental, and, you know, spiritual. Like, it's, it's an it's a all-encompassing notion of wellness, much more so than a few years ago when, when it was, um, you know, those kind of elements were less at yes. the forefront. Um, I mean, that's, that's two in... I think in New Zealand, uh, the, another one that's less about maybe about the engagement data, yeah. but something that I think is going to appear very soon in the data, if, if I hypothesize, is 
what's going on with with AI um, and you know chat GPT being uh, <laughs> the equivalent level of Google you know right? I, I, I chat GPT it like, that's a thing um, and and what is now coming out on a daily basis that is fundamentally like paradigm shifting for many industries in New Zealand I don't think people realize that yet um, but you you need to look out for that. If you have a listening program in place today, you need to look out for the the signs uh, in the data of how your employees might be impacted with this new tech. Uh, and I would also put out there that if you don't have an actual strategy um, about how to incorporate this new capability, even just the productivity side of it, into your business, in a few months you'll be left behind. I mean, it, this is like the day that Windows appeared, uh, Microsoft Windows appeared on, on the scene in ordin- magnitude times bigger, I reckon. Uh, and most people in New Zealand probably don't really get that sense that th- it's here and it's happening right now. Yeah. So that's, that's a bit of a look to the, look to the future yeah. and something that's moving with, with a lot of pace. Um, and the, the other areas that you mentioned, I think, are very much reflect other survey data I've seen, like EMA's wellbeing survey we did with NIB really focused in on those frontline managers as yes. the ones that were bearing the kind of stress and needed that needed needed the support, um, and obviously that links to the piece that so much of this links back to now, which is about how do I retain my key talent uh, because uh, there's options for them to go elsewhere and um, they, they're likely to do that. In in New Zealand. We've never seen a tighter labor market, mm. right? People aren't even arriving at our shores uh, in the rate that they used to. And that tap probably isn't going to, you know, there's no yeah. on button for that, you know, immediately. And I, I would even put out there that highly skilled people that want to be here aren't necessarily able to. And there's lots of stuff that could contribute to that. Um, but you have... A challenge if you lose one person, a key regrettable attrition um, scenario in in a small business, that can also be a watershed moment for other employees. Well, why did why did they leave, right? And you're not going to be able to fill that seat necessarily, if especially if it's specialized skills in a market that those people are not hunting. So you might be paying through the nose to get someone back in, and then having to ramp them. I mean, it's just the knock on effect is huge. Um, so I would, you know, they, kind of the other piece, not necessarily trends in the data, but if you're not monitoring your future talent, if you haven't created that cohort within the data um, or able to identify them in your business, that's a, that's a pretty big red flag. And if you have identified them, how, how closely are you, are you to those employees, um, not only as a senior leader, but your frontline leaders, right? And, and ensuring that they know that they have a future, they have role clarity, right? Like they know what good looks like, because if you have a future leader, they're always going to be striving for that. Um, and they have the, the, the feedback back to them of how they're going, because so often top performers it's just assumed they know they're a top performer. Mm. And that's just not the case, right? People intrinsically need feedback, um, even if they're at the top of that, uh, that ladder, to, to keep going, yes. to keep striving, and, and to challenge them. And really, like, you don't want to don't lose one of those people right now. And, and it will have huge effects in the short and medium term for that for your business. So for an organization, um, listening survey, uh, listening surveys can help um, find out the sort of information that you might not find out for, on an individual basis until the person comes and says, oh, uh, Luke, I've got another job, I'm, I'm leaving, and or there's, a, there's an exit interview, and, and those sort of things. It's like, well, if we could find out the sort of canary in the coal mine early on, get the early antecedents of this, that we could take action and, and think what to do? Is, is that one of the benefits? 100%. Um, you, you have to bring the methodology that yep. we were talking about into it. 
in order for that to occur. Mm -hmm. But you know, you have the capability today to see the trends in attrition. Yeah. Um, up to, I mean, PECON claims, uh, Workday PECON claims, nine months in advance. Right. Right. Those trends appear, and you wouldn't have noticed it nine months in advance yeah. necessarily, um, because it's aggregated data. But you know, there is almost 500 million data points um, that go into a data model that is al that allows you to see that now. So yes, that's fundamentally possible, and there's um, there's a, numerous ways and means to get to that endpoint. Uh, you know, in the past, that was that took a huge people analytics team mm -hmm. and a, a, a huge number of resources to get to that, and you don't you know you don't need that today. Um, and and really, taking a more nuanced view, yes, this is aggregated. When you think about uh, employee listening, this is confidential, therefore it's aggregated data. But how can you break down that data um, and then cross-reference it with other types of feedback yeah. or other key KPIs according to that cohort? So that, you know, we're talking about top performers. You might have um, that, that cohort identified across multiple um, uh, sources of data. And how can you bring those together to really take and understand where people are at and take the right action? You know, that's an incredibly powerful pl place to be. And creates it, it creates a lot of um, sense of investment with, with those employees as well, um, especially if you're being transparent about what you're doing with this data, uh, because they want to know that they're being invested in, right? And and that uh, that can really help you as a senior leader to, to deliver that picture back to them. Okay. So, I mean, some of this is like, I sometimes feel like we're, we're drilling into some s sort of specifics and what, what, what you can do on an individual basis. And we're picking up some, some trends to kind of go, OK, so this is this is where things might go. Uh, these, are, these are the big issues that are around retention, attrition, wellness. And you mentioned AI and the really kind of thinking ahead. And that one about thinking ahead interests me um, because sometimes I have the sense that um, – you know, New Zealand and the way in which COVID was managed here and with, with lockdowns and the yes. business subsidy support, um, maybe some of the things that are happening overseas are happening earlier overseas that may, may come here. Um, so, you know, maybe we're a little bit behind in, in opening up. Um, and I just, just wondered if your, your daughter sort of had any suggestions around that. Are there, are there trends that are happening overseas that aren't happening here yet? that you think might? I suppose that's my question from that. Ooh, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. I think um, New Zealand and Australia, from a COVID perspective, kind of created that, that bubble early yeah. on. And actually, you saw some really interesting divergence from the rest of the world. Mm. Uh, it, engagement, actually, in, in our data set, it went up in the most dramatic way uh, at the start of the pandemic. Um, much more so than the rest of the world, yeah. Uh, it, but on average, the, the all the the data, all the scores actually went up, which is to me it was flabbergasting. <laughs> like, how on earth yes. is is this happening? But I think people were um, largely very, very appreciative of a lot of the efforts to help, you know, from from employers to help uh, their employees in this time of crisis. That has since corrected, right? Uh, and we are back at, at a level playing field. Um, but I, to your question about what's coming from overseas, um, I think this is not like what I'm seeing right now in the data, but what I can see from, uh, from kind of a slightly more macro perspective yep. that influences the data, right? Um, is the talent marketplace shift. So we are shifting in, in a huge number of ways, but in particular um, from a borders point of view and from a skills point of view, mm -hmm. right? The skills point of view is the AI and a, a completely new skill that most employees are gonna need to develop very quickly um, to, to maintain and vastly increase their productivity in the role that they do. But then the borders, um, I think what's really interesting is, uh, especially, well, I, I, I'm thinking about this from a, a tech perspective. Yeah. Look at um, countries around the world, so Spain being an interesting one. 
just came out with what's called a digital nomad visa. Yes, yes. Right? And you can go and live and work there uh, in companies that aren't necessarily in Spain, but um, as a highly skilled individual and get a visa for doing that very quickly. Um, and, you know, live and work there for, for years. And if New Zealand doesn't keep up with changes like that, our distance from the rest of the world might only grow and our talent, you know, we already have the brain drain of young people overseas. That might just get bigger if other places are a far more attractive place to be uh, and I can pick and choose where I work anywhere in many places around the world, not just, yeah. um, you know, where I might have the, the easiest visa into, you know, in, in years past, you know, going to the UK or, or what have you. Um, now it's truly a global marketplace for skills. Um, and if we don't, we, the New Zealand Inc., if we don't keep up with that, you know, we're going to face some pretty big challenges locally um, in our skills economy. You know, the knock-on effects there are potentially pretty big. Oh, definitely. I mean, um, obviously, EMA's re recent skills shortage survey talk talked about how people are advertising, uh, couldn't fill vacancies. 80% of people surveyed said that. People said they'd been advertising for more than six months, very commonly, couldn't, couldn't find the talent that they wanted. There's a survey, interestingly, there's a survey uh, that Elmo did about, about HR, and one of the things they, they have in there is about organisations are expecting to increase their headcount mm. um, at the moment. It's a bit like, OK, so how are you actually going to do that in terms of finding new people? Because um, really your challenge is keeping the people that you've got and getting your organisation to be more productive is probably... Uh, you know, route where uh, you've got a limited talent pool already. So all those challenges you speak of kind of all add into that mix there. And it sounds like, um, you know, just to start to get to an understanding of w what's going on in your organisation with your people and, and the way in which employee listening can, can help with that is very powerful for, for, for business owners. Yeah, if we don't um, kind of, in a way, radically rethink hmm. how our teams need to operate, therefore what skills need to be where, mm. you know, we will fall, fall behind and find that that ongoing <laughs> shortage only gets worse. Yeah. Right? Because even people in New Zealand will be working for offshore companies using their skills that does not, um, uh, <laughs> not necessarily benefit the economy in New Zealand Inc. in general. You know, and that that only <laughs> dramatically increases the, the, uh, the shortages you're seeing now, right? So, so we really do, in my eyes, need to understand what are the critical skills we have to have here with us in New Zealand and how can we find the best skills around the world to contribute to those that don't need to be right here in the room with us um, because that marketplace is opening up very, very quickly. Uh, and, and the countries that, that make that easy for people to live uh, uh, despite where they work are going to have a pretty big advantage uh, within that. Um, but, yeah, the, the talent shortage in New Zealand I don't think is going anywhere very fast. And, you know, that might – hopefully that, that doesn't come true, right? Like, I don't want that yeah. to be the case. But I just don't see any of those needles turning in the other direction right now. That's interesting. I mean, so we talked about these these big trends. We talked about listening in your organisation. So we've sort of gone up and out and we've gone sort of down and what this could look like. Uh, one of the things that really strikes me about the way you talk about things is, is very much the fact that you come with such a strong business perspective. And I'm conscious that, you know, effectively your journey has been a business leader in, in a growing tech company in, in, in New Zealand. So maybe we could just, you know, hear a little bit about, about that uh, from, from you. Yeah, um, you know it is. It has been a journey. Yeah, uh, I I came in uh, 2018. I landed back in New Zealand. We had our our first uh, our son, who was nine months old. We realized London uh, is is not the place we want to raise him. Uh, so we're, so back here with family. And I had done um, 18 months in in London with with Pecon, and thinking. I have it sorted. 
right? Like, I know what I'm doing. You get, uh, you know, we're, we're absolutely winning in many ways in, in Europe, um, and it's a growing business. And they, they took a chance, and they sent me, sent me back here with, with a laptop and said, okay, uh, you know, this wasn't necessarily on the plan, but, but go. Um, and I got to say, building a business is uh, in, until, you, until you start, um, you have no idea. Uh, it, is, it is so much fun and so hard. And I, and I can appreciate, you know, there's so many entrepreneurs in New Zealand. It's a very entrepreneurial society. I, I, I appreciate much more now than when I did even five years ago of how hard on a daily basis that actually can be, right? Um, I, we had no customers when I landed. Actually, we had one. And um, we had about five months before we got number two. Um, so, so not only like starting it from scratch is hard, um, but and, and lonely, and you know you question yourself. But if you know, okay, here's the the activity that I know will lead to the right outcome, uh, and you are confident in that in yourself. Um, I, I reckon you know keep going, right? Like that's there's um there's a podcast uh, called how I how I built this um, yeah. where you get entrepreneurs that come in and talk about their journeys and and one of the biggest things I I hear through you know and these are these are like massively successful people uh, the, the the biggest themes is just do something just keep going so that's one piece is right like I I had no idea how hard that would be uh, and I do now. So when <laughs> when I go and start the next uh, the next piece of that um, or my journey, uh, I'm I'm much more prepared. But then the second piece was I was so fortunate um, to get the right people on the team. So we added a few people in the first year into into the Pecon team, and then we added much more in the second year um, here in New Zealand. And you don't have a lot of global tech businesses that base their APAC operations here in New Zealand specifically. Um, so I think it was a pretty unique opportunity in that. But it, um, bringing on the right people made all the difference. I, I, I couldn't have done a tenth of what we accomplished without those people. And, and I think, you know, um, hats off to, to the, the team within Pecon to help qualify, you know, who we need in the business to be successful. But my gosh, I'm so, um, you know, it, I feel like it was a privilege that I had them on the team because um, once there, if you get the right people who are capable, you can kind of let go. Yeah. Right? And that and that that was something I, I had to learn along the way. But but if you can let go and let them own what they want to own, much more so than necessarily say written in their JD, or if you were a part of a big a, a big corporate. You know, you're very defined in necessarily what you do. Let them um, push the boundaries and explore, and the outcome can be amazing. Uh, and you know, like there's things that that we did as a as a team, um, culturally. Uh, you know, the way it evolved, um, the way we ran meetings, the way we we operated within each of the specific functions was different to the rest of the world, and within Pecon, like different to our Pecon world, and. Uh, it served us so well. Um, so, so yeah, adding adding the right people and just letting go and letting them be is um, is something I'll definitely take forward. But uh, learn learn the hard way as well. That's, that's fantastic. I see your your passion for that, and I think that kind of comes out as well. Really, around you're talking about the importance of the people that were there, and you know being prepared to to step up and go go for something new. So I think that's um, you know a tremendous. Uh, uh, read across to many of our members and the sort of size of business that they have that, that they try and grow. Um, so we covered quite quite a lot in this conversation today. And I feel we could almost have a whole separate, you know, part two with, with you've got obviously got so much knowledge and experience here to, to impart. Um, but obviously, I thank you very much for, for doing that, you know, particularly sharing with us, I suppose, the importance of, I suppose, the whole ecosystem that you put around a listening survey, um, e explaining where it might be appropriate for, for an organisation, not, not being scared to do it if you're a small organisation, um, but being ready to think about and make sure that you're taking on, well, how do we make sure that this becomes that virtuous circle of asking for people's views about what's important to the business 
and then taking action and then going going back again. So um, this has been a very, very, very interesting conversation. I'm, I'm really, thank you very much for coming in. Thanks, John. It's been a lot of fun. I uh, really enjoyed the chat. So cheers. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Luke. And um, thanks very much for for listening to to this podcast today. Um, you know, we're we're keen to make sure that what what we're introducing to people in these in these uh, conversations are new ideas and themes that are happening that are helpful for New Zealand businesses. So, um, thanks everyone very much for listening.